Welcome everyone to New South Wales DPI Dairies webinar number four, Success Factors for Robotic Milking on North American Dairies. Today we have the great privilege of having an international guest speaker with us. Mr. Jack Rodenberg runs Dairy Logics from Ontario, Canada. Jack has kindly accepted our invitation to share with you a bit of his deep knowledge on priorities in health, feeding and breeding, as well as accommodating robot-related cow behavior in facilities design and management. As an introduction to our speaker, in 2008, Jack retired from the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture Extension Service and started Dairy Logics as a way to stay involved in new developments in dairy technology and management. Over the eight years since then, Jack has consulted on barn design projects for dairy farmers throughout Canada, the US, Holland, Belgium, Sweden, Denmark, Finland and Estonia, with the support of partners working in these countries. Although they design for all types of barns, the specialty is robotic milking barns that maximize cow comfort and labor efficiency. Jax is also a certified cow signals trainer. He regularly conducts workshops on observing and analyzing cow behavior to assess herd management and housing. He also lectures extensively on robotic milking, dairy farm automation and precision technologies and all other topics related such as trade voltage and mineral quality of livestock drinking water. So Jack, it is a real pleasure, privilege for you to be sharing your insights and experience with all of us here today and I will hand over to you to be able to share with the audience a bit of your perspective and experience on this very interesting topic. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much for that uh, introduction, Nico. And uh, it's certainly a pleasure for me to uh, spend this evening uh, here in Canada. It's Sunday evening at 8.30 here, so to spend this time with you. Uh, I just turned 65 this weekend, and uh, so it's uh, uh, things like robotic milking and all of the precision things that are happening that keep the dairy industry exciting for me and, and uh, 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 I guess uh, keep keep me young. So uh, very happy to uh, to spend the time with you this evening to talk about success factors uh, on uh, on our dairy farms for robotic milking. Uh, so yeah, automatic milking in North America is becoming more popular. I think there's about two and a half thousand dairy farms now with robots, uh, mostly in herds with 50 to 250 cows, uh, mostly in Canada and the U.S. Northeast, uh, where these smaller dairies predominate. I would say Lady probably has about 60% of the business, deal of Al about 35. But we also have uh, GIA, uh, single box and small multi-box robots, and Bomatic and Incentec full wood. Uh, we even have a Canadian brand called Milkomax uh, that will put robotic milking into tie stall barns. If, uh, some of you may not even know what a tie stall barn looks like, but uh, uh, that's certainly very unique as well. Uh, we have one uh, GIA 60 stall external rotary with robots as well, uh, but uh, probably not uh, within the scope of what I want to spend my time talking about tonight. So uh, I guess if we're going to talk about success, we need to define it. And I have to admit and say that for a lot of uh, robot farms, especially in Canada, uh, the main reason for purchasing robots has to do with lifestyle. It gives the family farm with uh, 60, 120, 180 cows uh, a much more flexible life uh, because their working hours are more flexible, it's less physically demanding. Uh, they do everything with uh, family labor rather than with hiring outside help. Uh, it's a very safe workplace because there's not a lot of big machinery around and it's innovative and, uh, and, and keeps everyone uh, one interested and stimulated. Uh, and these are great things, but you, know, you can't take lifestyle to the bank and it doesn't pay any bills. 
Uh, and, and so it's kind of interesting to me that a lot of the, the technology purchased in Canada is not specifically economically driven. If you want to talk about profitability uh, as being you know, the driver for success, then the economics of automatic systems versus parlors depends on the cost of borrowing capital because robots are going to be more expensive than uh, most parlors in most situations. The cost of labor uh, because you will use less labor on dairies uh, that have robots and then how efficiently you use your labor in milking. Uh, so uh, what we see uh, the cost of capital is relatively low. We can borrow money for 4 or 5% interest as a rule, although our American neighbors uh, often have difficulty borrowing at all against investment in dairy assets because their banks are, uh, uh, they're not very, and they see it as a very, fairly high risk kind of, kind of market. They'll lend for land much quicker than for anything else. Cost of labor, uh, certainly fairly high in Canada. Around $20 Canadian per hour is what we pay a milker. Uh, lower than that in the U.S., probably $12 to $15 U.S., but increasingly getting more expensive and more difficult to get. Uh, and also lots of issues with immigration and uh, illegal uh, uh, workers in the U.S. and uh, more concerns around that, making it more difficult to keep people around. Uh, in terms of milking labor efficiency, what I mean there uh, is that on a, on a, I say a 240-cow dairy, uh, robotics is really a no-brainer because uh, if you're going to have an efficient milking parlor, so something that will make good use of a man's time is going to be at least a double 10 or, or perhaps a double 12 parlor. Uh, that's going to milk 100 cows an hour. If you have 240 cows, you milk them three times a day. It's going to operate seven hours out of 24. Uh, not very efficient use of the parlor. If you're going to hire labor to do that, you need people in uh, three, three and a half hour shifts or two and a half hour shifts and what do you do with these people the rest of the time and so on. Parlors seem to work much, much better on the thousand cow dairy uh, where you can first of all keep an employee working for a full shift uh, uh, to milk that herd and secondly you can keep that parlor running enough hours uh, to make it pay. So uh, if robotics and, and that kind of technology is a better fit on the smaller family type dairies, uh, then it improves their relative viability and I think that has great socioeconomic implications and, and if it uh, makes for a better uh, future for those kind of farms then uh, I'm all for that. In terms of what defines success in Australia, I visited dairies in your country uh, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm I always kind of think that uh, we call you, uh, you know, the dairy industry down under and maybe it's a little upside down in terms of the way we see the world and it certainly opens my mind uh, to see how many different ways there are uh, to do things uh, and, and fitting robotics into both large pasture applications uh, and seasonal calving I think is going to give you some more challenges than, uh, than we generally fail. In terms of, of you know, defining success in what you get out of your robots, uh, we sort of talk about 2,000 liters per day as being uh, acceptable or a reasonable expectation for a robot. Generally here that would come from about 60 cows averaging about 33 liters per cow. But we have lots of farms that would be uh, 20 to 30 percent over that, 2,600 liters a day. Uh, it's going to depend on milk yield per cow. Higher yielding cows tend to flow more quickly, so uh, you're going to get more out of your robot with them. Uh, it's going to depend on milking frequency, and, and that's going to depend on the milking permission interval you provide. It's going to depend on prep time, attachment success, refusals, milking speed, entry and exit times, and cleaning times. Uh, and so you want to optimize milking fresh cows and high producers frequently 
and low producers less often. And I think one of the real keys to success of robotic milking is to get very strategic about milking permission. Uh, you know, for, for years people here talked about, well, if we get 2.6 milkings per cow, uh, then the job is done. Uh, but we want to get three or four milkings per cow on the right cows, and we want to do that by decreasing milking permission for lower producing later lactating cows to make sure they're not occupying a space in the robot that we can use uh, more effectively than that. You want to minimize failures and for us that means clean udders free of hair. Uh, you want to minimize box time and so that means culling your slow milking cows. Uh, if you can cut one minute per milking uh, from your milking time you will milk 12 percent more cows uh, through, a, through a robot in the same amount of time. I think there's tremendous opportunities to improve this through uh, dynamic milking, capitalize on individual variation. And one of the robot companies is working hard at this, uh, you know, uh, let the computer determine uh, the milking uh, access and, and milking uh, frequency, uh, milking permission interval uh, for a cow, let the computer change it, uh, then assess how the cow responds and uh, either milk that cow more or less often based on that response. Some cows uh, give substantially more milk if you milk them more often, others do not. I think the same kind of logic and question needs to be applied to prep time. Uh, now, do we prep cows quickly? Do we prep them slowly? How will different cows respond? Uh, and that's something that the robot companies, I think, also need to look at automating and setting on an individual cow basis, again, with the theory of maximizing your, uh, your, your milk output from the system. Higher stocking rates increase the number of fetch cows. That increases labor, uh, and so that's something you have to watch out for. But we need to do more research uh, to further define optimum stocking rates for milk production per cow, for milk production per robot, uh, for how much labor is going to be required for fetching. And um, you know, with cheap money and expensive labor like we have now, we think we want to err on the side of more robots for fewer cows. So our guys are heading towards 55 cows per robot. Uh, as the way to keep the amount of fetching uh, down to a minimum, as the way to get uh, three milkings per cow uh, and, and, and fairly high production per cow and so on. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about genetics, a bit of a pet subject of mine. You know, our Canadian AI stud here, CMEX, uh, advertises that they have robot-ready sires. And so they have an index that they've come up with that puts emphasis on these nine traits listed here. Some of them make excellent sense. You need good feet and legs on a cow if she's going to walk to the robot. The milking speed increases robot capacity, teat length, and, and especially rear teat placement. We need a little space between them. Uh, that's going to uh, ensure quicker and more accurate attachment, and that also uh, increases robot capacity. But you know, there really is no science applied to this particular index, uh, and so I, I think it's high time that we start putting some science into this. The Dutch AI companies are at least proving sires for daughter box time. So they've said, Okay, milking speed is important. If we look at box time of this bull's daughters, we're getting milking speed combined with attachment time combined with how uh, quickly the animal enters and exits. Uh, and so that's going to be a major factor in robot efficiency. But there's a German study uh, that says the heritability of milking frequency of how often the cow comes to the robot or how eager she is to visit uh, is 0.16 in early lactation, 0.22 in later lactation. Uh, so that's a nice high heritability. Uh, 
And so I think it would be really, really beneficial if around the world we started to measure the time interval from milking permission to actual milking. Uh, and, and I think if we had that for daughters of sires, it would be a very useful selection tool to minimize fetch cows and to optimize robot efficiency. We need to start collecting this data uh, and applying some science to these robot-ready indexes and so on. When it comes to health, I really think we need to talk about hoof health. That's our experience here, is that lameness decreases AMS visits and increases the number of cows that we have to fetch. Of course, lameness is a multifactorial problem. It's affected by nutrition, cleanliness of the barn, genetics, cow comfort, and resting time, foot bathing, trimming, treatment. Probably want to put most of my emphasis in this talk on the last three of those. But as a cow signals trainer, uh, you know, we say that the cow stands on four feet uh, and, and, and one of those requirements or success factors is good claw quality. Uh, that starts with genetics, uh, depth of heel uh, is, is part of that, and then it goes to nutrition and, and uh, you know, a, a good balance, especially of things like trace, in, uh, trace minerals for, for harder hooves. Uh, not too much, not too much grain uh, in the diet. Uh, avoid acidosis and, and uh, the laminitis that uh, comes with that a month later. Uh, and 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 then we uh, we look at trimming in order to keep a good heel depth and keep the cow wearing the, the foot properly. Low infection rates uh, strongly related to how clean the environment is. So. Uh, is the uh, the floor the cow is walking on relatively clean and dry? Does she spend enough time off of it in a stall for her hooves to dry properly and so on? Low pressure, so that's uh, sort of physical factors, and that's mostly about lying time. Uh, we want cows in our freestyle barns to be lying there 14 hours a day uh, and and getting the weight off of getting them off the concrete. Uh, in, in order to uh, avoid laminitis and lameness issues. And then when there is something, when you have a hairy heel wart or whatever, uh, then early and effective treatment uh, is the thing that's going to keep that cow walking uh, robustly and visiting the robot regularly. Foot bathing has been a challenge for us. Uh, it's something we do in the exit lanes of milking parlors all the time. Uh, we find when we put a foot bath in the exit lane of a robot that really discourages visits. And so on the day the cows see that there, they'll visit 0 0.2, 0 0.3 times less than they would otherwise. Especially in free traffic barns, the number of passes through here is very unpredictable. You'll get a, a cow with a high milking frequency that gets milked four times or refused three times. If the bath is there for 24 hours, she gets seven passes, uh, while the cow that really needs it, the lame cow, she only comes through there twice. And, and uh, so you have one cow manuring it uh, seven times and not getting a lot of benefit. The cow that needs the benefit isn't, isn't getting it. So we've started putting foot baths in crossovers, remote from the robots themselves. This way you uh, drop the thing down, you fill it with chemical, uh, and then you gently walk the herd through it twice. Uh, so all cows get an equal number of passes. The chemical is fresh and works better. It's far away from the milk and the delicate metal parts of the robot and scales and so on. But it does disrupt the cow's activity and it does add the labor of the time it takes to do this. Uh, and strategically you can combine it with, uh, with bedding or with uh, scraping, cleaning the barn uh, and reduce some of that labor to some degree. I would rather do it this way. So here is a robot uh, in a free traffic barn with a separation area behind it. A cow that is milked and does not need foot bathing or separation exits straight out uh, one-way gate C with this gate set in this direction. Uh, a cow that needs to go to the separation area 
uh, exit straight out this way uh, with this gate uh, set the other way by the computer. A cow that needs foot bathing uh, follows the cow towards the separation area, but then a second sort gate here sends her through gate D back into the, into the main barn area uh, as shown by the blue arrows. Uh, when we have two robots in a group, so 120 cow group in this herd, uh, the cow that needs foot bathing is sent into the fetch pen from robot one, refuse through robot two, sent through the foot bath and back into the barn. And I realize that those extra passes here probably cost 15 seconds apiece, uh, but you know, on a foot bathing day that costs you probably three milkings on this robot uh, because it only involves half the cows. So here is an L layout. Uh, that's set up very nicely for uh, having that kind of a foot bath over here to the right of the uh, of the front robot. Uh, we get very excited and specific about barn design uh, and all the other aspect here is that if you have a cow that needs treatment, it's got to be easier to get her to a treatment area. So there's two robots here in this barn. Here are all the milking cows in uh, six and two uh, double platforms, so three double platforms, so six rows of free stalls, perimeter feeding on both sides, dry cows back here, fresh cows in this straw pack, a calving area behind that, close-up cows behind that, and with a handling chute or two uh, in between these two robots that's easily accessible from all areas of the barn, uh, separated cows from the milking robots will be here, can be returned, uh, fresh cows, calving cows, dry cows, everything's very close by and easy for a single person to move. Our rule of thumb is one man working alone should be able to move any cow from anywhere in the barn to the handling chute in, uh, in a minute or less. So there is that chute, uh, which essentially that becomes the heart of the barn. We're also looking to, to keep this separation very flexible. So if you're just separating a cow or two for to pick up her feet because you notice that she's lame or whatever, you can do it from this robot by the brown root, from this robot by the brown root, and then this cow can be milked uh, while she is separated in this robot, work through the chute and back into the barn in either area. On a day that you're doing herd health, so the vet's coming in to do his pregnancy checks, you could separate 20 cows into this area by crowding these dry cows back a little bit uh, just over the one night uh, and using that additional space for these milking cows that you're separating and, and working back through there as well. And when you're not separating, if your close-up heifers are back here somewhere, you can use this robot and this route as a, as a training route to teach these cows uh, about the process and about the fact that there's something nice to eat in here. Uh, three weeks or so before calving to reduce the stress of them having to learn that after calving. Uh, if you ask a Canadian or an American farmer what's the most important thing uh, to get a robot to work well, he'll tell you it's the feeding program. And part of that is what you feed in the robot itself. Uh, you want hard pellets with no fines. So if you see this, call the feed company, take it out and start over again. Uh, research says that if they're made from barley or oats, so small cereal grains, cows seem to do better on that. Uh, <coughs> I think because partly because it is a harder pellet than a corn-based pellet. So we get more visits, more milkings. Uh, high fat reduces visits substantially by 0.36 in this research trial. And a forage type pellet, uh, while well, you see you can't fool them with that, it has to be something they really like uh, because that really decreases visits. Uh, in terms of what you feed in the bunk, we find that high grain, high starchy type diets decrease milk frequency uh, as well. So lots of fiber in the forage, a uh, pasture type diet uh, with a limited amount of grain would make the robot very, 
much more attractive uh, than it is for a lot of our cows. Now, so yeah, we need to strategize about designing a feeding program that optimizes the visits and minimizes the fetching uh, while keeping feed costs reasonable. Uh, the uh, the people who own blue robots uh, and and as that's a bit of a selling point for them is that uh, they they uh, tend to encourage the guided traffic approach. Uh, so they will feed a total mixed ration uh, formulated at close to the herd average. So that's a mixture of grain and forage fed in the bunk that meets the. Uh, requirements of the average cow and then over overfeeds the, the lower producing cows uh, and, and then they'll use a small amount of concentrate in the robot just to keep the cow standing still uh, and give her something to do it's fed at uh, 100 150 grams per, uh, per minute maybe 200 grams a minute uh, just to keep the cow occupied while, while she's being milked Typically, that results in the lowest purchased fee cost, uh, and, and that is a goal for a lot of producers, but this guided traffic, it does mean you have fewer fetch cows, but it also means longer standing times, especially for timid cows, because once they go into the commitment pen, they have nowhere else to go, uh, and often they will end up being there while higher ranking cows go through and get milk. Uh, that timid cow may be there for a couple hours a day uh, before she gets milk. <coughs> More time spent standing with no access to feed means sore feet, means more lameness, means fewer meals, uh, bigger meals, more room in acidosis. So a timid cow has a difficult life in this kind of barn, especially when uh, it's a barn that's very close to capacity. Uh, this system also, of course, wastes grain on low producers because there's more grain in the, in the TMR than what those cows require. With free traffic uh, systems, so this is a cow can come to the robot anytime she wants. The only thing that gets her or attracts her there is the grain that's the pellet that's fed in the robot. Uh, these herds are feeding a partially mixed ration. Uh, so that ration is formulated for seven kilos of milk less than the group average and then they're fed from two to eight kilos of pellets uh, in, the, in the robot according to milk production. So our research says that that results in more milk per cow, about a kilo more in a recent trial, more milk per robot, about 70 kilos more than guided traffic systems. Uh, it means a fresh cow and a late lactation cow have a higher forage to concentrate ratio because they're eating this ration that's formulated below the average of the group. Uh, and then they are gradually after calving fed up to a higher grain intake and that generally means fewer metabolic problems. You do have more fetch cows with this system but you know, sometimes a new fetch cow is, has diagnostic value because it's an early warning that this is a developing case of lameness or a, or a case of clinical mastitis. If you have a new fetch cow in this free traffic barn, sometimes it's your first sign that there's something wrong with that cow that you need to do something about. Whereas with guided traffic, even a cow that has a clinical mastitis quarter is going to keep coming because the alternative is to starve. So the, the, uh, the, the other option uh, that we see as well, and this is much more common in Europe, is a free traffic burn uh, of just forages in the bunk, two to eight kilos of concentrate in the robot, and then another zero to eight kilos of concentrate in the computer feeder preferably one that's accessible only when the cow is not eligible for milking. Uh, so De Laval does this by having that computer feeder in an area after the robot that only the milked cow can go to. Uh, Laley does it by just programming the computer to not feed that cow uh, if she's eligible for milking because then she has to go to the robot instead of the computer feeders. Uh, 
I, I think this is going to work the best in terms of reducing the number of late lactation fetch cows because everyone uh, has a desire for that grain because there's no grain in the forage at all. And it's also the best opportunity for dynamic feeding. So, you know, what dynamic feeding is, is some cows respond to more concentrate and others don't. So we can take a cow uh, close to peak lactation, give her a little more grain and see how she responds to that. If she responds, she gets to get, get it again the next day. If she doesn't respond, then maybe after two or three days we give her a little less. And if she continues to produce well, uh, that's a cow that does well on forage, we give her a little less again. Uh, so that essentially the computer becomes the manager that's starting to make these kind of dis decisions and individualizing uh, the way the cow is managed and fed. So it looks like, you know, we all threw out these computer feeders here in Canada and the U.S. about 10 years ago, and it looks like that the old may be new again uh, and that we're maybe looking at going back to some of that uh, equipment again. So yes, uh, guided versus free traffic uh, is a huge controversy for us here. Uh, I would say both work. Uh, free traffic uh, generally results in greater cow comfort, especially for these timid cows. New fetch cows are often new cases of mastitis or lameness, and so it might offer some management information even though you're fetching more cows. The guided traffic decreases the emphasis on feeding in the robot, reduces the number of fetch cows. Uh, and when there are really strong economic incentives to do this, then it might be justified, but cow comfort will, uh, will always suffer when we do. Both can work uh, very well with good management, uh, especially when the system is not at capacity. But when things go a little wrong with guided traffic, the cows suffer because they get fewer meals and longer waiting times and then foot health and rumen health issues uh, start to happen. With free traffic, it's the farmer who suffers because when things go a little wrong, he ends up fetching a lot more cows. So which of these is more likely to get solved quicker? I think if the farmer is seeing his life getting more difficult, he's going to step up his management quicker. I design for both, but for me, cow comfort is really important, and so I have a very strong preference for free traffic. If you want cows to do well in a free traffic setting, you've got to make this milking stall as attractive to the cow as you can. So we'll put ceiling fans over top to keep the flies off while they're in there uh, to give them a little extra comfort now, I was at a talk the other day where a ventilation expert says, well, why don't we just put some really good extra fan capacity over this whole area in front of the robot, and you want to make the cow comfortable in here. You don't want to make it the area in front the most attractive part of the barn, because the last thing you want to do is draw a lot of uh, cows there that are not being milked. That's just going to interfere with your flow through the robot. So, I mean, the whole barn should be well ventilated and attractive to the cow from that standpoint. But a level entry so that the cow doesn't have to step up to go in. A rubber floor in here so she stands comfortably. Highly visible from the barn so that uh, and all the timid cow can sort out for herself, is this a good time to go or am I just going to uh, spend a lot of time waiting because there's other cows trying to get in and so on. The box itself is a factor. We've really seen here, uh, I've had several clients replace Lady A2s uh, with Lady a 4 So an A2 had a butt plate touching the cow's rear end, the feed bowl indexed to shorten up the box, to give her no room to move. It was fairly narrow. Uh, the A4, much more room in the box. The cow can move backward and forward fairly freely. Uh, and when people made that change, the number of visits went up fairly dramatically. So I think cow comfort in the box uh, is an issue to the cow. Uh, 
if you do have a robot with a butt plate and an indexing feed bowl, uh, make sure you don't get overly aggressive with tightening the space up. And I see a lot of these robots where cows are standing with bent backs. I encourage those farmers to reduce the indexing on the feed bowl. They may get a little bit more kicking and, 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 and detachments uh, for a week or so afterwards, but generally visiting frequency goes up uh, when you make the cow more comfortable in the box. I want to close off by spending a little bit of time talking about barn design. Uh, which is kind of my specialty and, and we try to focus on cow comfort first uh, and then labor efficiency and, and clearly those two go hand in hand because if cows are comfortable, they visit on their own, you don't have to fetch them, they stay healthy, so you don't have a lot of treatments and so on to do. And then get cost uh, value for the money you spend and then build something that's expandable because when you reduce the amount of labor in the dairy significantly, uh, you're going to want that dairy to grow. So, classically, uh, we like to start with uh, six rows of cows here, perimeter feeding, robot here, robot here, handling area in between, both robots facing the same way, a bedding pack for fresh and lame cows behind here, Perhaps your maternity pen here, your close-up uh, cows here, uh, your, your uh, sort area and, and separation space here with far-off dry cows in behind that. Uh, space is critical. Uh, this is the way we used to build barns. This is the way we started building robot barns in Europe. Uh, so this is a free traffic barn on the far end, but here by the robot, the thinking was we have to guide the cow into it. Uh, perhaps they thought she couldn't find it any other way, I'm not sure. But we learned very, very quickly that a timid cow never comes into this space because it's like a funnel that she can't get out of and the boss cow is going to come along behind her and beat her up so she doesn't want to go here at all. She becomes a fetch cow. Uh, because we got to go and get her. So we now design with large open space in front of our robots. So a timid cow can stand here and wait. If an aggressive cow approaches from here, she can go in this direction. If she approaches from here, she can escape in this direction. So open space with escape routes. Don't do anything to attract other cows here. You probably want some water because cows like to drink after they get milk. Uh, but your cow brushes, your grazeway gates to pasture, all of those things should be as far away from this space as possible. Uh, and if you're going with a guided traffic barn, then make these one-way gates uh, fairly wide so you reduce congestion around those areas and so on as well. Space is an asset through the whole barn. Now, if I look at this picture, this heifer's got to get to that robot three times a day to make his money. Uh, is she going to succeed at that? Probably not. Um, and farmers will, will suggest, well, we should build these barns with wider alleys. But the goal is not to have a whole bunch of cows standing around comfortably in wide alleys. The goal is to have them laying down. And if these cows were resting 14 hours a day, 60% of them would be laying down in the free stalls. There would be lots of room in this, in this aisle. So stall comfort is the issue here. We need bedding, we need the neck rail partly forward, we need a longer stall here, and so on. So cow comfort is important. Does the orientation of the robot matter? We used to say, well, they got to go, when they exit the robot, they got to go to feed. So face them towards the manger. Uh, but what we see in these burns is that despite a large percentage of cows that either use the left-hand robot or the right-hand robot, <coughs> but they don't use both. Uh, <coughs> and that's a disadvantage if one of these is down for service. Uh, these cows are going to go on milk because they just are not going to go to that robot. So we had some students look at this and, and, and how many cows would use both robots uh, at relatively the same frequency, 40 to 60% of the time. Um, 
many cows would selectively just use one or the other. Um, and across 1,200 cows and 12 herds, this is what we found was 40% of the cows were pretty good at using both. 20% were fairly selective in their use. We got the lowest uh, selectivity or the highest cross use when we put both robots side by side like this facing in the same direction. And so that's basically the barn design I try to use now. Uh, simple rooting uh, for fetching cows. So you pull a gate down here, you start fetching and cleaning cells, you bring them up the other side and into the fetch pen. Always away from the manger because this is where it's hardest to sort cows out. So you want to have the least fetch cows in front of you uh, in that area. Simple rooting from group to group. So here's your far off dry cows. They move over here as close ups into a straw pack, into a calving pen, into a fresh group where they get milk this way for a few days, and then into the main milking barn. When you dry them off, they go back uh, into that pen again. Handling fetch cows should be low stress and promote learning, and that's where we use this split entry fetch pen, uh, one on each of these robots. So here's the design. Cows from the barn still have access to this robot here. A cow that you put in the fetch pen uh, is waiting here, uh, and she has a little bit better access because the gate opens in this direction, uh, and she's going to enter, uh, enter through there. So if you think of this as progressively teaching the cow, you know, the first day a heifer has never seen this thing, you wrestle her into this corner, you pull this gate beside her, you push her into the robot with your shoulder. The next day you put her here in the corner, you chain uh, behind her here, she takes the last step on her own, the third day she's in the fetch pen and has to take the last six steps on her own, and then she graduates to the barn. So. Uh, and I'll make it a, a learning environment because these cows do have to do it on their own. Maximum comfort for fresh and lame cows. They're in a bedding pack with robot access uh, here. Uh, easy for you to move them, easy for them to go on their own if they choose to do that. And that could also be part of your stress-free calving line. So close-up cows, calving cows, fresh cows, all close together in a very similar environment, minimize the stress on these cows uh, <clears throat> through that transition time. So to get this all to work together well, <clears throat> rather than feeding in the center of the barn, which we have done for years with parlor barns, we now feed on both sides so that all the cows are together in the center all have good access to that handling area and it's very easy to move cows from group to group and so on. So these design factors I like to build in, open space near the robots, all robots facing the same way, simple rooting, split entry fetch pens, fresh and lame cow pack, stress-free calving line, flexible grouping, that barn I showed you could have 60 cow groups, 120 cow groups, uh, and when we make it bigger, it could be even 240 cow groups, flexible separation area, perimeter feeding, straight lines through the barn for material handling. We really get into that. We talk about expandable, so I showed you this barn with two robots sitting this way. We'll put two on the center platform, all four now facing the same way. You can sort from this robot into this separation area. You can sort from this robot into this fetch pen, refuse the cow here, get her there again. And then you can do that with eight robots and 480, 500 cows. Uh, at that point, probably you're going to build additional barns and connect them with a, a link down the center that will feed cows into this, uh, this separation area between the robots. Just as a closing note, what do I see in the future? Uh, I think we're going to see robots applied more and more on larger herds as well. Uh, that's going to depend on the economics. We're going to have to develop new management strategies for that, uh, new barn layouts, perhaps some new feeding and genetics thinking as well. Uh, for us, a big benefit of robotic milking is that we bring milking closer to the cow. I don't see that in your pasture setting you've that yet. 
and and I do think that this is going to come. This is a system where you take the robot out to the pasture, reduce the walking for the cow. Uh, <laughs> that has to be in the future of robotics in, the, in pasture settings. Is it worth bringing it even closer to the cow in the barn as well? You know, some of us can visualize a robot mounted on this headrail at the feed manger uh, and just milk the cow when she comes up for forage. Uh, one never knows. I, I think innovation is never done and uh, we can only speculate what's in the future. But robotics saves labor, it improves the culture of labor, it's modular and simple to manage, it improves cow comfort and health, it has the potential to improve feeding and milking efficiency, uh, so I think we're going to buy fewer parlors uh, and buy more robots in the future. Haven't talked much about people, but people are definitely part of the, uh, the success equation. Uh, to be successful with robots, you need to learn to become a coach. You need to start to think about how can we motivate cows and provide the environment for cows uh, where they're going to attend voluntarily because that's the key to the system. So I hope that's uh, been of interest. Uh, from our perspective, we focus on cow comfort and convenient handling. I think we can do a good job with robotic milking in this North American setting. So questions and discussion. Thank you, Jack, for such a fantastic presentation. I think you have made all of us really aware of so many things to look at and analyze when considering the adoption of new technologies on farm. So thank you for that. Uh, there is a couple of questions here. Um, one is, what is your perspective on large herds farms and what do you see has been the adoption of robotics in large herds in North America? What do they define as, as large herds? And has there been any studies done on economics on, on comparison between um, robots and conventional dairies at a region level or a brand level or system level? Like, do you know what has been done in, in, in those lines? Okay, that's a, that's a very interesting, uh, interesting question, Nico, and, and it's, uh, it's definitely sort of the new field that we are exploring. Uh, I've been asked by the American Dairy Science Association to write a book chapter in their, in their new book on large herd management uh, on the uh, application of robotics in a large herd setting, which they uh, define as being over 500 cows. Uh, and you know, probably worldwide, I think you may be looking at about 50 or 60 herds in total. Uh, over 500 cows uh, that are using robotics, uh, some with uh, you know, robotics on rotary milking parlors, uh, some with uh, 10 or more uh, you know, conventional single box robots, uh, but certainly there is nothing has been done yet in terms of formal research studies. Uh, to, uh, to look at the effectiveness and, uh, and, and the economics uh, here in North America. Uh, I think that there is, uh, there is potential there. There is potential uh, in terms of labor saving uh, and, and in terms of, uh, I think, improving the productivity of the cow. Uh, through these things like dynamic milking and, and, and dynamic feeding uh, especially. Uh, the large herd owners that I've talked to so far, uh, several of them, you know, we, we see this as, uh, as our social license to produce milk in the future uh, because the cow has a better life. The cow does not, not have to spend uh, three hours a day standing in a crowded, hot waiting area, holding area, waiting for milking. Uh, we give the cow a better life. We're going to have uh, a, a customer that's happier because you know, animal well-being uh, is becoming a much more important factor uh, in terms of the consumer here in North America as well. Uh, 
So is it coming? Yes. Uh, it's probably going to be slower and, and, and a little bit more challenging to sell than it is at the family farm level where uh, it's just become the, 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 uh, the system of choice. Uh, anyone here uh, you know, milking 120 cows that needs to replace uh, milking parlor equipment because it's worn out, 90% uh, of them go to robots. That that is really an impressive, an impressive statistics. We we always talk around fifty to sixty percent at a European level of new dairies analyzing robots. So yeah, that that's an an impressive statistics. From the large herds perspective, Jack, do you think there's any special considerations farmers should take into into, into consideration when looking into robots? Like, would you how many robots would you put together in in, in let's say an eight robot setting? Would you put all of them together? Would you split them in size of the barns? Would you keep heifers on one robot? Uh, would you keep, keep, let's say, colostrum cows or hospital cows on one robot so you don't need to rinse and wash that robot over and over when a cow comes in? Like, is there any special consideration when looking at large herds? Yeah, I think that's a that's an interesting question, uh, and and you know we can only really speculate about it. Uh, in in my uh, we we have a, a number of herds uh, that have got uh, say three robots in a group uh, that seem to be quite happy and content with that. I know of one herd with six robots uh, in a single group. Uh, they seem to be good with it, but I think they spend far too much time looking for fetch cows, uh, and and I also think that is stressful on some of the uh, the smaller, more timid heifers and so on. So, uh, from my perspective, if I were designing right now for a thousand cows, it would probably be uh, either two or three robots per group. Uh, we would definitely have first calf heifer groups and mature cow groups uh, to reduce uh, the competition and perhaps also work with a bit smaller stall size for those heifers and so on. Uh, I think you would probably have uh, a fresh group, uh, say, on a big bedding pack uh, and, and also bring lame cows back to that robot. Uh, and, and ideally, you would have that one placed close to a second group of, of at least, say, two robots so that when you have a person there doing the training, you can access those other robots as well. Because it's just not practical to have all your problem cows on one or two robots because essentially the man working with them is going to put a cow in that robot and then have nothing to do for the next eight minutes. So uh, during that time that you assign a person to do that labor, uh, you would want them to have access to probably at least three robots to work with, uh, even though you're not going to need that many for that special needs group. Uh, in terms of handling, <coughs> On a large dairy, I want to be able to separate cows in the robots, but I don't need to have large separation areas where I hold cows overnight and so on, because I'm probably going to have some trained staff doing things like pregnancy exams or breeding or uh, picking up a foot and looking at it and so on on an ongoing basis. So if I have people to do that uh, on the job for, say, 12 hours a day, then during those 12 hours I'm going to separate cows out of every robot and have these people circulating, dealing with the cow, returning her to the group as quickly as possible. So uh, I'm drawing these barns now with 180 cows in a group and probably only about six to eight separation stalls. Uh, behind that group of, uh, of three robots. Uh, the, the challenges that uh, we're having a harder time with, uh, the cows never leave the barn area, so in, uh, in, in parlor barns we traditionally 
add bedding and scrape the manure out of the alleys when the cows are away uh, in the milking parlor. Uh, <coughs> they no longer leave now, so you either automate that uh, with uh, well, alley scrapers, with automatic bedding delivery systems, uh, or you start working in among the cows. And uh, the automatic systems are certainly the preferred way on the smaller dairies, uh, whether that continues to make sense on a large dairy or not, we're, we're going to have to wait and see. Uh, but, you know, the notion of driving through uh, three times a day with a, uh, a vacuum tanker to uh, clean the manure out of the alleys does not appeal to me. I, I think we're going to be using alley scrapers. Uh, most yeah, of the time. especially for, for large herds, those logistics become become quite a thing. The, the other question, Jack, I was going to ask you, and I, and I really liked that you covered that topic because it is a topic that that I do like and and I find it very interesting. Is that of pushing the boundaries, looking at the individual cow level, and you talked a bit about the dynamic settings and all that. There is one we monitor nine farms in what we call the KPI project. So we monitor nine farms on a monthly basis around Australia. And there was one farm in October at peak production. He was harvesting 2,500 liters of milk per day with 75 cows per robot. So he's got three robots, 220 cows. He was having 75 cows per robot. So very high efficient system, but he's wanting to push the system even further. So he's looking at those fine tunings of milking permissions and, and all these type of settings that yes. you covered, so we might be in touch for that. But my question is, have you seen an improvement of, of system capacity of farmers looking at that level of detail at the individual cow level? And similar to that, those systems that kind of talk about the robot-ready cows and all that from a genetic point of view, have you seen an improvement um, by using those genetics at a system level? Absolutely. Uh, I, I, uh, I know farmers in Holland that are on all 70 cows plus per robot, uh, 26, 2700 liters. Uh, one of them in, in particular is a pasture farm uh, and <coughs> cows highly selected for milking speed, for example. Uh, that's one very, uh, very simple way to increase your robot capacity, uh, and and you know you like if you start looking at your slowest milking cow in a herd, uh, even if she is a fairly high producing cow, uh, if she is preventing you from milking two other cows instead of her, uh, she's a cow that needs to go and and. Uh, there is no other system where that really is as big an issue as it is in, in, in robotic milking. So uh, the Europeans looking at box time, uh, I think that's going to be very valuable data for sure. Yeah, yeah. We, we have a, there's a student here at Sydney Uni looking at cow efficiency and the difference between two cows or what he's called efficient and inefficient, that they produce, the efficient cows produce more milk with less milkings. So so basically, and I was talking to the farmer, this one that I mentioned before, last week he's looking at the same things. Two cows both produce 7,500 liters, but one with 350 milkings, the other one with 220 milkings. So, so if you can start working at that level, I think you can start gaining a lot of efficiencies. The last question, Jack, just not to tie you up and set you free on a Sunday evening, from a from a cow management point of view and system design of the layouts, what is your recommendation on training protocols for heifers? Um, because we see some farmers struggling with the performance of heifers. So, so from a layout or management point of view, what is the recommended or the standard of training heifers that are completely naive to the system? Do they do it before calving, over how, how much time? What is the common protocol here? Okay, the, the, uh, the, there's, there's certainly wide variation among farms. Uh, a lot of farms say that their heifers are in a different barn, it's just not convenient for them to do anything with them and, and uh, 
and so the training happens after calving. Uh, but you're certainly going to find that there will be fresh heifers that in our system uh, will need two weeks before uh, they go on their own. And, and, uh, and that's a lot of fetching. There'll be other cows, it takes uh, other heifers, it takes three or four milkings. But uh, some things you can do ahead of time, some are very simple. Uh, definitely always, always, always expose these heifers somewhere in their heifer environment uh, to one-way gates uh, of whatever style you use uh, in your system. Uh, and, and I see that a lot of, of Australian systems obviously often have some fairly elaborate uh, gating and, and elaborate laneways and so on. Uh, and, and if I were advising a farmer that had a system like that, I would say build some of that same complexity into your heifer barn or into your heifer pasture setting uh, so that these animals are very comfortable uh, with that whole process of, uh, of moving around through lanes and through one-way gates, uh, etc. And uh, you know, very often uh, once a few animals know that, then the others will train them. Uh, so you know, if, if you're making group changes by age in your heifers, for example, always leave some uh, experienced animals behind uh, who can teach the new animals coming coming into the group. Uh, at calving, uh, certainly, you know, the the, the uh, giving them ex ex exposure to the robot before calving, uh, three weeks to a month before. Uh, have them go through the robot, learn that there is a nice grain to eat there, learn that there is an arm that moves around and makes noise and brushes and, and so on. Uh, all of those things will uh, increase the animal's comfort with it when, uh, when the time comes uh, for actual milking. Uh, if you can, you know, if you have the robot capacity and, and, and the time and so on to do it. Uh, I like to expose the cow to as few new things as possible at the actual time of calving because that's a pretty stressful time uh, already. Now, does that happen on the majority of our farms here? I would say no. They get exposure to the gating. They learn about one-way gates in the heifer barn. Uh, but the most cows, most heifers never, never see the robot itself uh, until, uh, until after they calve. Uh, and so, yeah, that's, uh, that's a, a, a bit of a difficult time for them uh, that you're going to have to get them through. Again, is that something genetic? Uh, maybe. Is it important enough to, uh, you know, start uh, keeping track of it and making it a select selection criteria? Probably not. Excellent. Excellent, Jack. So, well, um, I would like on behalf of, of everyone really to to thank you for for all your your insights and, and your help. I think um, you've really alerted us of things to look at and which things should we be considering to look at when, when looking into robotic milking and cow behavior. Some of them were specific to North American systems or Indo systems, but a lot of the principles still apply for pasture-based systems, so I do really want to thank you for your time, and I really look forward to hearing from you again in the future. So thank you very much. Very happy to do it, Nico. And uh, it's it's even if we're, uh, we're doing things very differently, sometimes we can all learn something from each other. And uh, so I uh, uh, eagerly follow the developments in uh, in Australia as well, and uh, wish you great with robotic milking there. Excellent, Jack, Jack, thank you very much. So to, to all of you, thank you very much for, for attending this webinar today. I really encourage all of you to visit the New South Wales Department of Primary Industry website where you will be able to access tools and resources about the dairy industry. There is a specific section on robotic milking systems. The link is on your screen at the moment and it includes a lot of information not only on robotic milking, but also on precision dairy farming. So once again, 
Thank you very much for joining today and hope to see you all next time. Bye.